what was it like? Did you have any major financial concerns? Was the bill top of mind when you finished medical school? I can actually start even before that. So I've been like an immigrant twice. When I was one, my parents moved from India to Australia. And then I grew up there. I went to school through the end of high school there. And then when I was in 11th grade, my dad got a job in the States. And I had a year to prepare for the SATs and apply to colleges. And the educational system in Australia is free for us being immigrants from Australia to the U.S., even going to undergrad, it was a huge shock to the system. I went to a private undergraduate university. I went to NYU. And back then, I commuted from North Jersey into Manhattan every day. And just the commuter tuition was like $22,000 a year. Oh. I, I looked it up the other day and actually like just the commuter tuition, not including room and board now at NYU is like 65. It's crazy how much costs have gone up. So I was very lucky because undergrad, my parents actually helped me out with that. And I, I didn't have any debt entering medical school. But once I got to medical school, uh, I went to a public medical school. I went to Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, which is now part of Rutgers in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, the tuition in those days was around 25000 per year. And then I took out extra money for room and board and food. By the time I graduated, I had about 160000 always wrote the loans. To answer your question, what was top of mind? Back then, I didn't really think about it. It was such a large amount of money. And I know people are coming out with like much more now, and they probably were then as well because their parents did not help them out with undergrad. But, but now the average medical student debt's like above 200K. Many people that went to private schools are coming out with four or $500,000. Um, but even then, I remember thinking... Uh, that it just didn't feel real. It just felt like eventually we would all become attending physicians and magically this money would come out of our paychecks and be taken out. It just didn't feel real. It just seemed like another hurdle that we had to take on to get to where we wanted to go as medical students and residents. What was that process like when you were applying for medical school how much conversation went into the cost? I'm mm -hmm. talking about from the folks that are facilitating this process, whether it be the university, the financial aid area, parents, how did costs come up in the conversation? I don't remember very much of it, but again, compared to a lot of people, I came from a position of privilege because I always knew that if something horrific happened, I would just go and crash at my parents' basement until I figured out my next steps. <laughs> Some people don't have that family support or backing. I think they have to be a lot more calculated. I was actually waitlisted at two schools in Manhattan at Columbia and Cornell that were gonna be vastly more expensive. Even back then, they were, uh, I think they were around $50,000 per year. And I was willing to pay that tuition back then if I got into them. And I had never actually moved off the wait list so it wasn't even an option for me. But again, getting back to your specific question about what the process was like, there weren't, the people in the financial aid office really didn't discuss, from what I remember, what implications this had. I think the only specific things they went over were that student loans never leave you. You can't mm -hmm. declare bankruptcy and get rid of your student loans. And then they went over the interest rates and the payment terms. But there, there wasn't any sort of real financial discussion about, and I don't think people should pick specialties based on the amount of debt they have, but it, it would be nice to have information about who got paid what when they're finally done. I think that discussion never, ever happened in medical school either. I honestly had no idea the big disparities between the primary care specialties and how much they earn and how much the surgical super specialties are. Again, I'm not saying that should decide what specialty you go into, but again, if you have a two-way tie between two things that you're passionate about, maybe it would make a life-changing difference to you to pick a, an alternate specialty. No, and, that makes sense. How do you think it would have helped? And then we're veering off of course a little bit because I think it's yeah. important. This is not just unique to the medical profession. 
it's also a consideration when you talk about attorneys and picking schools, they leave with a tremendous amount of doubt as well. And these conversations don't seem to be happening when it's most important. Yeah, in my particular situation back then, it, it wouldn't have made too much of a difference because I didn't have a spouse. I didn't have dependents. My parents were still working. One of my parents is still working now into their 70s. So I don't have to worry about them. But I know because I'm a part of so many of these groups, mm -hmm. I'm just amazed at the number of people that start families. Kudos to them. I can't imagine being a medical student in debt or a resident on very low income having to support multiple kids and stuff. And for those people, it makes a huge difference when you're responsible for feeding other human beings, housing them, being responsible for healthcare costs, about how much their tuition is going to be, what city they end up living in for residency. And we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute because I picked the most expensive city you could possibly live in. Again, I realize now, looking back on it, having talked to hundreds of medical students, what a position of privilege I was in just having that family backup of parents that still worked, that had some source of income, that had their own house, that if something really horrible happened, I would have probably gone and camped there to recollect and figure out next steps. And, and a lot of people just have no backup at all in life. Yeah, it makes it harder. I know that for anyone getting out of medical school or any sort of higher education, having the conversation of reality and whether it be getting connected to someone who's had the experience of graduating, picking a specialty, just having those connections with folks that have gone through the um, experience is so helpful. Throughout all my years as a planner, I've seen clients put themselves through all kinds of debt to send their kids to school, not just the, the students, but the parents as well, taking out loans. Um, and a lot of it is just because you get into a situation where you want to do something, but the money is never a consideration. And then it's just there. And no parent wants to tell their kids no, right? Especially if they, they get into these more expensive schools. And then who doesn't want their kids to go through medical school? right? Whether you have the money or not, you're going to support them. And, and that's for a person that has that family support like you did. And like you said, not everyone has that support. Not everyone has that backup, but the financial implications of, of going through those processes are there. I wish that when those conversations are had, there's also a reality conversation. What does this look like when you pay it back? Because the main focus of those conversations are this is what you can do but there isn't much of a conversation of what it looks like when you're paying it back. So just so that it's not such a shock to the system when it does start happening for people. So next question, how did your financial situation and or priority shift when you started your residency? I actually found my tax return from like 2010 the other day, and I made $58,000 as a resident in Manhattan. The wow. I think it was like my third year of residency. My rent was basically half of my take-home pay. I, I lived in a fifth-floor walk-up, but I chose a place that was very close to the hospital. It was in Murray Hill on 28th mm -hmm. Street and Lexington Avenue. The NYU hospitals were all on 1st Avenue. But it, it was almost half of my take-home pay. The, I still remember the apartment was like fourteen fifty a month, but it was important for me to live alone in that stage of my career. I couldn't deal with roommates that had different schedules or weren't respectful of my sleep cycle and things like that. So it was a huge chunk of my paycheck. The other thing was that some people were very disciplined about meal prep and buying groceries to save money and things like that. Unfortunately, at that part of my life, I, I was not so disciplined. So I was also spending a huge amount of money, like eating out. Yeah, just, especially just to, very hell. Just to I survive. Mean. And our residency program at, at NYU, actually, a lot of days used to have a lunchtime lecture series where they would provide food because the ACGME, the, the Graduate Medical Education Council, would give them some funds. It was basically just pizza and salad. A lot of days I was just eating that, not very healthy, the pizza part especially. But again, I was fortunate in residency that I didn't have any dependents. 
And so I had that additional luxury of being able to spend my discretionary income on food and on whatever it was once a week, Friday or Saturday night, be able to go out with friends and spend a little extra money there. But I'm sure we'll get into some financial mistakes. But besides my 403B maximizing that, which I think in those days from 2010 to 2012, the maximum amount you could put in was like 16,500. I really didn't save any other money living in Manhattan as a resident in those days. But you were able to max it out during that. Yeah, as far as I can remember. And the the only way I did that was to make the decision ahead of time, right? And specify that it should come out of my paycheck because there's no way that once that money hit my bank account that it would have been saved. I think one lesson I've applied afterwards is like that whole pay yourself mentality or, or to automate things. Now, when you change from residency to becoming an attending, if you don't have that discipline of opening that extra investment account or that extra high yield savings account and setting up the automated flow where immediately after your paycheck's deposited that your money doesn't go into some other physical place, it's really easy to outspend any level of income. Residency gave me a glimpse of that. So you were maxing out your retirement account through NYU were you able to save anything outside of that? No. Again, this goes to financial literacy or illiteracy. It didn't even cross my mind when I was a 25, 26 year old that I wasn't reading any sort of financial education material, no blogs, nothing like that. I was just trying to learn about becoming a doctor. And I had this huge sum of student debt over my head. And I wrote a blog post for Andwise about how actually my final year of residency to get some extra money so I could go on vacation, I actually made the mistake of putting my loans into forbearance, Mm. which they allowed me to do. It wasn't a very difficult process. I just contacted my loan servicer, which back in those days was Sally Mae, and they made me sign a form. And it's, it's embarrassing and funny now that I've survived it, the forms laid out the fact that interest would continue to accumulate. Yeah. You know, but in, in my mind, I didn't put that together that not only does it accumulate once, but now that amount that's accumulated is compounded forever until you pay off the debt. It was, it was quite a costly mistake on a, on $160,000 to have, go into forbearance for a year when if I'd been more disciplined, I didn't, again, I didn't have any dependents. I didn't knock on wood, have any medical emergency that I needed to cover. It was just purely discretionary spend that I felt like I deserved after mm-hmm. three years of residency to go on a vacation. And I used a couple of extra thousand dollars rather than put it towards my day-to-day expenses or debt repayment. That's that's one of the mistakes I talk about that I made. Going on vacation isn't a mistake. The way to approach it would have been just planning it and just trying to save over time and not going into forbearance over it. But doing things like that, that's not a mistake. It's just planning for it and ensuring that you don't hurt yourself, other areas of your financial life by going on the vacation. That's the priority. I had a conversation with someone a young person still in college and has their big first big job. And we had a conversation about just don't set out to say, oh, I'm going to save this 20%. Why are you saving this 20%? Oh, I'm going to have about X amount aside for discretionary. Okay. Think about what you're going to actually use that money for, because if it's just blanket vague, then you don't have much of a plan behind it. It's very easy to just not stick to whatever plan that you think you have in place. Thinking about what you want to do with those funds makes it more likely that you'll actually follow through and save and spend the money in the way you intended it to. It's just a a exercise of spending a little bit more time, getting a bit more details with yourself because you hold yourself accountable to what you intend to do. And for anyone in the situation that you were in, especially when half of your income is going to just having a place to live, you do feel like you deserve to enjoy yourself. You're working like crazy. All these hours, 
you probably are spending all your money on food once in a while going out. And that's probably, it's probably not living the lavish New York life that people think we live in New York. But there's a way to do it. So that way, everything else is taken care of at the same time. Okay, so down to the next question. What were the significant financial shifts when transitioning after residency? A lot is going on. You're leaving the residency program. When I finished residency, that's when I started doing the math on how long it was really going to take me to pay off these loans. I started learning about terms like loan consolidation mm -hmm. and looking into private lenders where I could refinance the loans because I had a mixture of federal loans that were between 2% and 6.8%. Two or three years after graduating residency, I found a private company called SoFi that was able to refinance my loans, basically bundle them all together and give me a rate of 3.75% with a five-year repayment term. So the course that I was on before there was no end in sight for the repayment. I hadn't educated myself on anything like public service loan forgiveness. I, I can't even remember, to be honest, if it even existed in 2012 when I graduated. But if it had, I didn't educate myself on it. And then the, the second thing was that I probably wouldn't have qualified for it because I worked, after I finished residency, I worked part-time and I volunteered overseas in Haiti part-time. And I think part of the terms right now, if I'm not mistaken, full time. you have to work full, full time. time. Yeah. And then the other thing was that I started thinking more about post-tax savings and what, what I should be doing. Because prior to that, I was doing nothing. I started learning about terms like an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. uh, again, due to lack of discipline back then, I was never able to get it up to the suggested amounts like most people if you if you read blogs or books or something a lot of people talk about three to six months yep. of fixed expenses fixed recurring expenses i was never able to get it up to that amount but at least i got it up to one or two months and again i was getting, right after graduating residency i was a period of my life where i did i were, didn't have a spouse didn't have kids i was able to take more risk in terms of not financial risk, but like professional and personal development risks. Like I said, like for a year, I just did some locum tenens work, which is part-time traveling work mixed with volunteering in Haiti. And then the following year, I actually took a fellowship at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, and basically earned resident money. Again, it was like a $60,000, $65,000 stipend to work half the year as a hospital medicine attending physician and half the year in uh, Haiti, just because I was interested in, again, working abroad with, in a resource challenge setting, helping people that had, were still recovering from the earthquake. And financially, it probably wasn't the savviest decision. It definitely didn't help me to compound my wealth, but in terms of my life's mission and what was important to me then, it was really nice to have the flexibility to do that. I gave up my apartment in New York so that I wouldn't be on the hook for paying rent while I was working three months in San Francisco, three months in Haiti, three months in San Fran, three months in Haiti. After that, I took a job in Boston with Brigham and Women's Hospital. And again, I, I only took a 50% full-time equivalent job. I realized that people that have dependents, that have medical debt, that have elderly parents that don't work. These were all privileges that, that I was able to do these things because I didn't have any of those other financial stresses. At that point of my life, I only had to worry about myself. I was able to take this 50% full-time equivalent job as a hospital physician at Brigham. And then the rest of my time, I went and worked in rural Nepal as a clinical advisor to this not-for-profit called Possible Health. And then finally, after I got back from a year of that, then I got married and I moved to South <laughs> and got my first real job. I would say that all those decisions were good decisions because you did it at a time where you could. You had this freedom, you had this flexibility. Yes, you had this student loan that obviously the faster you pay it off, the better. But 
I really believe that when folks make this sort of decision to maybe not be in the best financial situation, but if it's by choice, so even me, I'm not working super full time, not making as much money as I could because I'm making a choice to finish that executive MBA program. But you plan for it, right? I do have a son and a household to take care of, but it was a plan. And it just means that I'm just not making as much money for X amount of time so I can accomplish this part of my journey that's very important to me. And those parts of your journey were important to you. And it was just good timing. And when you do that on purpose, it's great. What's not good is when you get into unhealthy financial situations, not by choice, because you didn't save enough, because you didn't plan enough, or you do have other responsibilities that you haven't accounted for when you make those decisions. Yes, you, you didn't make as much money as you could have, but you, I'm sure you don't regret the time you spent abroad, overseas, or working less time in the traditional sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. There was definitely a conscious you know, use of my time and energy. So. Okay, so next question. As you settled into your career after residency, what sort of long-term financial goals emerged? So you mentioned after you start participating in those programs, you got married, had your first real job, you said. Yeah. <laughs> so what started to change? Yeah, it's interesting because I'm married to a physician also. I think a lot of the goalposts shifted. One of the mistakes I talk about in my blog post is that I never really had a written financial plan. Mm -hmm. My dad's 72 now. He's still working, completely different industry. He's in IT computers, but I don't think he has a plan either. And so one, some people work to keep busy. I think a lot of physicians work because our schooling was so long and we want to be helpful to patients and not have our skills be wasted, quote unquote. Not that you have to do clinical work. There's a thousand ways to contribute to patients or even outside of patient care. But I, I think the, uh, the things that changed were that I uh, had a spouse. One thing I never thought about before in my mind was like home ownership. I, I had done the rent versus buy calculations, and I was one of those people that always was, especially in a really high cost of living area like New York or Northern Jersey, we moved to Jersey City afterwards. Um, I would just never have been, even a two physician couple, we would never have been able to afford to buy a place in Manhattan, which is where we like to live. And so it tipped heavily towards renting. But then once, once we had our first child, and we wanted to be closer to grandparents, then buying a house became a financial priority. We had to plan about how to put together a down payment for that. And then we had to do all sorts of things that I had just neglected for a little while, like putting together estate planning documents and wills and healthcare. How did it feel uh, doing that? Yeah. How, what was the feeling like? It's such a big transition. You, you go from really focusing on the freedom and being flexible. Still, I don't think that your finances are still there because you, you are making some decisions, but then all of a sudden you're making a lot of decisions, especially financially oriented. Yeah, but it feels super scary and un unknown because a, a lot of your identity as a medical student resident, and if you choose to do fellowship, is just follow this very laid out path go to work every day, collect your paycheck. Essentially, you're a W-2 employee for a decade, if not longer. And then suddenly you become an attending physician and you have all sorts of options. But you also have a lot of responsibilities. Now, should you choose to have a partner or a spouse or children? And a lot of people's parents are still with them, getting older, mm -hmm. developing chronic problems. And so it feels scary and a little bit disorienting. There's a whole host of things you have to put on your to-do list to make sure you get them done at the right time. A lot of my physician colleagues talk about like disability insurance and how yes. you need to buy own occupation disability insurance at the right time because and anything can happen to anyone. And unfortunately, some people miss out, miss out on 
buying their own policy and they get caught in this awful they they fall through the cracks and aren't able to buy their own policy yeah getting it when you're super young in residency it's always recommended we should have a whole session to start disability insurance on the process but it is important and fortunately there are a lot of companies that have specialized programs for physicians to allow them to get as much coverage as possible at the cheapest rates possible at the right time but you're right it has to be done at the right time you try to do it when you're attending and 50 years old it's it's not going to be a fun process at all okay yes. i don't know if that answered your question sorry <laughs> and I it, did, it did it did because it is overwhelming all of a sudden you have all these decisions to make it feels losing a part of yourself but then gaining peace of mind and i think the peace of mind part is hard to see when you're in the process but when you have a family to take care of and you know that you've done everything that you can do to ensure if god forbid the worst thing happens that they'll be okay that's it's worth whatever stress you go through to get the things in order but you do have to complete it in order to get that satisfaction of feeling like you accomplish something really important for yourself and for your family yeah and they don't make it easy for you there's like buying term life insurance there's oh, thousand yeah. forms to fill out there's medical exam you have to go through and yeah and stuff and it's not like you can just go online give them your checking account information and pay the premium like they really make you jump through hoops to get to yeah them. they do and I, I think most people don't know your electronic medical records for insurance companies is a lot like your credit report mm -hmm. meaning that if you have a medical condition you don't disclose it properly and you get denied insurance it's the worst thing that can happen to you on this report if you are unsure and all of you are physicians so you know a lot about your health but if you're unsure on how an insurance company is going to view your medical history a lot of companies will have you do the pre-application they'll look at the records without an application and give you an idea like a pre-approval for a mortgage and in doing it that way you don't get that hit onto your profile for insurance companies that will hurt you later on for getting insurance. This is super important for disability insurance because that is the insurance that you guys need first and foremost. So if you have something negative show up, it'll hurt you going forward to getting it. You, you just reminded me of a super important point as well, or like often a tangent of that is that the issue of like self-prescribing medication when you're in residency or afterwards yeah. at any point there, there are obviously prescription databases that they look at and yeah. the pharmacy databases and all of this stuff gets pulled up. Some people, unfortunately, I've seen stories online where someone prescribed themselves a sleep medicine or a anxiety medicine yes. for, to help them on an airplane. And then the, the disability insurance carriers <laughs> wanted to put in a mental health exclusion if they were even willing to give them a policy in the first place. Yeah. So it's like, there's all sorts of risks with not being able to qualify for disability or life insurance. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They're going to come through your record very carefully. Yeah. And things that people do all the time. I've seen people not get approved because of their Adderall prescription for the, mm -hmm. the anxiety medication is the big one mm -hmm. that a lot of insurance companies depending on dosage and frequency and how long you've been taking it will definitely exclude it, especially for disability. So all these things that show up, they, they go through all of this. Uh, an insurance company's job is not to pay. Yeah. And receive premium. There is a process though that you can go through with most insurance carriers. So that way they can take a look at everything and give you some feedback and give you the green light as to whether or not you should apply. That was the last question I had. So I did have another sort of like wrap up question. So looking back on this journey, which is pretty incredible if you think about it because of where you're at today and what you're doing, what's the one financial lesson that you wish you would have known at the start? The thing that I tell everyone that's younger than me is have a written financial plan. 
and I think you you hit on some of this earlier when you were telling us what's the point of saving this money that you and I have talked about in the previous community hours about how there's all sorts of like rules like informal rules oh the four percent rule like whatever mm -hmm. number x is that you have in your mind to retire on the day you retire you can safely withdraw four percent of that number every single year but again what are you going to do with that money what are you passionate about I've heard some financial bloggers and stuff talk about a conscious spending plan. And that's really interesting because different things are important to different people and that's okay. Some people value high-end goods and cars and jewelry and other people want to help their families. And like being an immigrant and seeing what my parents did for their extended families and stuff. One thing that's really important to me is being able to help other people in our extended family when, whenever we can. And so part of my conscious spending plan is I want to have this amount of money because I want to have a buffer to help other people should they ever need it. And so to answer your question, like one, I wish I had a financial plan when I started off, because again, yes, going on vacation is important, but I, and it kept me sane throughout residency, but I would have planned better. I wouldn't have gone on forbearance because I didn't have to, I, sh I should yeah. have just eaten out once less. I should have just offered to not pick up the tab for all of my friends that were bankers or lawyers and probably could have afforded it and didn't even care that I picked up the tab. To me as a resident, it really hurts you picking up a $250 tab. That's yeah. a huge chunk of your paycheck. Not that I did that every week. It adds up over the course of not having that financial plan. I'm going to automate this amount of savings I'm going to. And unfortunately it carried forward because the first few years out of residency, I had some, and I've written another blog post about this. I didn't educate myself about what I could do with extra dollars earned. Like I had some W2 income, but then I had some consulting 1099 income. And, and if I had met with a financial advisor earlier on, or, or had some sort of strategy, perhaps I would have been educated enough to open up a sol solo 401k or a SEP or something mm -hmm. like that. And I didn't do that. And it's just money that I left on the table and you can't really undo what's already been done. But if people can have a financial plan from when they graduate residency or shortly afterwards, they'll benefit from other people's mistakes. Yeah, and I'm definitely and saying that doesn't mean something complicated. So you don't have to go to a financial planner and get that $5,000 written financial plan. All I mean is just literally write it out. What is your plan? And it doesn't have to be super detailed or very complicated, but just write it out. And that just helps. It gives you a guide and the plan will change. That's another thing too. understand that the plan will change and it's yours. Don't yeah. try to live someone else's financial plan. It's not going to work. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Shah has a question or a comment or go ahead. Yeah, sure. The, hi, Dr. Shah. Hi. Um, thank you guys for this. Um, uh, thank you, Vern, for the great anecdote. Um, it's been a good discussion so far. Um, to get down to material things here, um, we've thrown around the statements, things like written financial plan, and investor policy statements. Do you guys have like a template? or something that someone who's just starting off can use to frame their thoughts rather than piece it together from forums and financial advisors, things from savings accounts to entry-level investments. And that would, could be something potential that, for example, Andwise could create and create sort of like a shared mental model for people coming in and trying to adopt a plan or at least learn about how to put a plan together, let alone a budget. Yeah, that's certainly something we can work on. I know with Kanav, which is Varun's co-founder, I have shown him something simple that's like a one-page financial plan that we will probably be working on. But in the meantime, I will for sure send you a template that you could use sooner than later while we work on the more automated version of it. That sounds good. Yeah, I'd be happy to look at it and share some thoughts. So. Awesome. All right, I don't... Did you have any questions? Yeah. No more questions? Yeah. No, no um, more questions. I think you ended it on a great note. The other, the last thing is besides having a financial plan, the, the other piece of advice I'll give people just unsolicited, solicited advice is I would, 
be very careful about investing in things that I didn't understand. Yeah. I haven't lost a life-changing amount of money, but I definitely have blown a couple of thousand dollars on silly things like Bitcoin that I really didn't understand. I'm not saying the technology is silly. I think blockchain has a tremendous number of applications and people that understand it and know the right places to invest and all of that jazz and not risking more than one to 2% of your um, disposable income. That's great. But I think there's, there's so many things on social media right now where you have uh, bias from people that have won in a particular space, whether it's NFTs or cryptocurrency or even real estate. I see so many like physician coaches and stuff selling courses on short-term rentals and there's nothing wrong with that except that now reality has changed and we're living in like a seven and a half percent interest rate environment for mortgages and inventories at really low rates. So the people that are really talking with great enthusiasm about some of these things, perhaps invested at a completely different time period from you and me in the days of 2% or 3% mortgage rates. And anyway, that's, you see this all the time, whether it's like the Wall Street, that's people trying to prop up or short particular stocks or people pumping cryptocurrencies. But I would be very wary about investing in things that you didn't understand without doing like extensive research into it and just yeah, following it out. I definitely second, that's a good gauge. Do I understand it or not? The other gauge I would um, ask you guys to use is if I lost all this money, would I be okay? And it's also because Unfortunately, physicians are a community of folks that are always sought after when it comes to investments, especially alternative investments. There's within the financial industry, doc doctors are big targets for all kinds of investments. And a lot of it, at least what I have noticed, it's just because you all are so busy and the right person tells you the right thing. A lot of times doctors just don't have the time to do the due diligence and it comes off as if it's an easy situation for people to invest. So one, for sure, if something comes up and you have questions, certainly reach out to me. But two, when it comes to investing your money, make sure that, that you can take that kind of risk. And if it's something you don't understand, probably stay away from it. And if you do understand it and it still feels super risky, just keep it to as minimum in terms of percentage of your liquid assets or your income. Yeah. Awesome. Tanya, thank you so much. And on that note, I just wanted to remind people of the website, joinandwise.com. If you scroll down and go here, you can go right on Tanya's Calendly and book some time for a complimentary financial consultation with her. And feel free to reach out to me at any time. My my email is my first name, V-A-R-U-N at andwise.net. I'm sure if you just go anywhere on these pages, you can find one of my blog posts and reach out to me. Thanks. And, so me sh and share that link. I enjoy those meetings, by the way. So if there's someone that you're talking to, one of your um, colleagues that has a question or it just happens to come up, say, hey, we do offer this resource. So definitely book yeah. some time if you need to. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time tonight and for Thank joining you. us for another community Thank hour. You. Tanya, thanks for your expertise. Good night, guys. We'll catch you at Good the night. next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.